to another episode of the 98% Life After Prison, a show in which we explore what it's like for the 22,000 people who are released from prison each year in North Carolina to return to their communities and rebuild their lives. I'm here with my co-host, April Barber. In April, you have an anniversary coming up. March 24th, you will be out of prison for one year. So, how are you feeling about that, and how is your transition going? I think my transition is going well. There are a lot of things I feel like that I've accomplished, but after talking to a lot of people, I think there's still there's a lot more for me to accomplish and a lot more for me to do. You know, I sat behind bars for 31 and a half years and dreamed of doing so many things, and I want to do them all and sometimes all at the same time, which is impossible. So I have to, you know, pace myself and remind myself that I can get done what I can get done and some things just aren't meant to be. But overall, my transition is going well. So what are the things that you would like to accomplish like this year or say? Um, I would like to finish my education. I want to uh, pursue a BA. Um, when I left, I had a lot of credit, so I need to see exactly how close I am and go to a college and do that. I've even looked into perhaps doing it print-based because that's how we learn in there. And sometimes it's best for those of us who have a busy schedule. Um, I want to look into maybe buying a house sometime in the future. Of course, being um, an excellent producer like my coworker, doing this <laughs> podcast, continuing my advocacy business promoting my my books and my merchandise. So that's the things that I really look forward to doing in the upcoming year. Goodness, girl. <laughs> that's enough <laughs> for a couple of lifetimes. <laughs> but I know you'll do it. I just know you will. Today, we're going to dedicate our show to SWIFT, Success While in Transition. William Elmore was released after serving 25 years of a life sentence. Tommy Green was incarcerated for 12 years for armed robbery. Following their release, they both gravitated towards working in human services, helping other people. Will mentors at-risk youth who were dealing with substance abuse, justice involvement, and often mental health challenges. He works for Reintegration Support Network in Chapel Hill. Tommy works for the Orange County Health Department for FIT, a program that connects formerly incarcerated people who suffer from chronic conditions with badly needed health care. In 2019, Tommy and Will teamed up to form SWIT, Success While in Transition. They work with justice-involved people who are trying to reintegrate back into the community, teaching them interpersonal and logistical skills that they will need to navigate as free men in the world. April and I, about a month ago, sat down to talk to Tommy and Will about SWIT. This is a shortened version of that interview. So what does SWIT stand for and kind of how does it work? SWIT stands for Success While in Transition. And uh, it's actually a 21 principle um, workshop that me and him created. The 21 principles are 21 steps that we took to be successful. And we pair that with peer support while our participants are taking the class because we understand the need to have someone that has kind of been there, done that, to walk with them hand in hand while they learn the principles and kind of help them get back on their feet by connecting them to other resources in the community and just just being a mentor, a guide, a counselor, or whatever they need at the time to make sure they're successful. And you say that it was based on your own transformation, really, in, that started in prison. Is there anything you'd like to say about that transformation? I'd like to say that it wasn't just based on our transformation. It was based on an index of the mistransformation, I would say, of so many guys that we knew personally that got released and had all of the problems in the world about, I don't know, about getting themselves together while they were out. And we knew so many people that were struggling in ways that we weren't. And we we took an honest look at that. What was it? Was it family support? Was it camaraderie? Was it peer support? Uh, was it 
a lack of belief in oneself. What was it? And we we indirectly interviewed people that we knew to kind of troubleshoot what are the sticking points? What's the difference between you and I and them? And when we kind of found those common denominators, we troubleshot them and we brought those back to people. And people say, yeah, if I had more of that, I think I would have did better. And if I had those principles, I think I would have did better. And I think I would have been better. And just knowing that that transitioning is not as easy, no matter how intellectual you are, no matter how many books you read, no matter how prepared you might think you are, you need support. And we model what it means to be unprepared and what it means to be able to find preparation through SWIT. So when you say, if I had more of that, maybe I could have been more successful. What were you finding when you asked those questions? What did people really need that they weren't getting? So um, the thing about it is like when when we see that when we see someone struggle, for example, right, and we sit down with them and we go over like what steps they took in this direction, in that direction. And then we kind of like sit back and, and look at where the mistake may have been made or where they could have done something different. Or we'll use maybe an example from our lives of a similar situation to where we kind of overcame that. And then we show that person, look, this is the steps that we took. Not saying you have to, but maybe if you don't think the steps we took are the right ones for you, well, let's look at your steps between our, between your steps and our steps. And where can we find a fair middle that you could try that could possibly be that could possibly help you become successful or be successful? It's a trial. And I mean, with this population of people, you have ups and downs. You know, we have a lot of success stories. I'm not going to say we have a lot of unsuccessful stories, but we have a lot of stories that were a little bit more challenging than the success stories. And then on the flip side, we do have a handful of people that just don't get it or may have reoffended or so on and so forth. And in those cases, I think me and I think I can speak for Will when I say that in those cases to us are the best cases because it gives us a chance to kind of really analyze where we may have went wrong and what we could have possibly done different to help that individual out. And we try to learn from those cases as well moving forward. You also run a reentry house in Hillsboro. So you've had a lot of experience with reentry. Um, what is what are some of the important things that you think it's taught you just being in the field, as it were, being on the front lines of reentry? I would say one thing that I've definitely learned over the years of doing this work, and that is there's no cookie cutter model to be successful in transition. Also, humbly, you know, me and Will, I think we feel like we came up with the best model, but there can be some holes in ours as well. So what the biggest lesson I think we've learned is you got to be in the in the words of the great William Elmore, a chameleon in this field. You have to adapt to the situation, the circumstances, the problems that come up and arise and just deal with it as, as best you can. But again, it's no cookie cutter model. And these, this is one of the most challenging population of people to work with because we're because it's played with people with histories of um, substance abuse trauma, sexual abuse, so on and so forth. Just that prison experience alone is one of the most traumatic things you can you can go through. So it's just that we learned a lot of patience, if nothing else, and accept the failures. Again, some people just not going to get it. And some people, it's, and again, we, we don't even necessarily give up on those people because even the ones that don't get it, we feel like they will eventually. Maybe they have to read. Maybe they have to go back. Maybe they don't. Maybe they need to fall a couple of times. But eventually... I think if they follow the SWIT model, they'll get it and be successful. What are your hopes for the SWIT program? What would you like to see five years from now? Five years from now, we should be able to look at each other and have a solid sense of our success rate. And what I mean by success is when we've been able to give away what we have come to know about transitioning from incarceration back into community, and someone can look back at us and say, 
I've really applied what you have shared and it has helped me in this way or that way in our lives. We quantify that as a success. And when we get those kind of reports, we get excited. And five years from now, we will have SWIT packaged in the curriculum. And that curriculum would allow us to go in and out of any prison or any institution as we will to start conducting SWIT facilitation on the inside, not just on the outside and transitional houses. When we can get inside prisons and have a curriculum that's respected nationally or globally, I'm very ambitious. I would look at Tommy and look at myself and say, we finally arrived with what we have because we're able to get it to people that are doing their time while they're still doing their time as opposed to when they get released. It's so much harder to kind of attack or share sweat with an individual that's released because they, they got everything coming at them at one time. And all these pressures about work and, and, and trying to get reintegrated into your family and, and finding a driver's license, all the stuff that Tommy and I both know from having been incarcerated, they're kind of bum rushing overwhelmed in ways that they don't even know in real time. It just kind of slams them down one day, all of this stuff, they feel bombarded. But when we could get inside and we could have a live, no pun intended, captive audience, and we could show them, look, these are tools you can use, not just now while you're here, but also if you get to practice now, you'll be that much ahead of the game when you get released. Then I feel like we arrived in another way on another level. But SWIT is never done because the trauma of prison never goes away. And in the words of Bruce Lee, we must be like water, able to go to and fro, forward and back at any time because life is always evolving. It's not waiting on you to catch up to it. And that's even overwhelming. That makes a lot of sense. What else um, do you think is important for people to understand about SWIT or reentry in general? That's a good question. Um, I would say I just want people and future participants to understand that it isn't easy. You know, it's not these kinds. Some of our concepts are not easy to grasp. Some of our concepts can be a little retro to them. But at the end of the day, all the concepts have been tried and have proven to be successful well, and proven to work. You know, so with that being said, I would just say just patience, practice patience. If you made it, one of the things I tell our participants in almost every class, if you made it through prison, you can make it through anything. That means you can make it through your transition out here. You can make it through getting a better job. You can make it through all the ups and downs is going to come with being a convicted felon in America trying to make it. Once you, once we like really drill that in their heads, I think that's when, again, shoulders drop. People start really grasping the concepts and people just take to it. Now, on the flip side, of course, dealing with this population of people, again, you have people that aren't going to get it. You have people that are going to be slow to get it. But as long as we stay patient, which I think we have the most patience in the world because you're dealing with a guy that came off a life sentence and another guy that did over a decade in his in the, at the prime of his life. So, you know, if you can get like we use that same mantra, if we can get through that. If we made it through that, then we can make it through getting through to our participants. If that makes any sense. It makes a lot of sense. Um, working with the prison system, reentry has and rehabilitation has not been part of the model that they have going in North Carolina. Have you had any success in talking to people in Raleigh? Are they interested in perhaps letting you inside the prisons to actually teach SWIT? Oh uh, yeah, we we've been able to talk to some people. Gave our candid opinions about um, reentry, what it is, what it isn't, when it should start. And some people enjoy just the conversations. Some people enjoy their name coming up in the credits saying they had the conversation. And some people really want to know what they can actually do to uh, minimize the problem. Most people that go to prison get out. And 
Most people that get out of prison are expected to be successful just because they found employment, which is a myth. It's not true. It's so much more that people need. And Tommy, nor I waste any opportunity to say that out loud to who's, who's ever in the room. Because Tommy and I are the two guys that got out and found employment, but also realized there's so much more that we need to be healthy, to be have a peace of mind and have a sense of self. Because prison kind of sucks the sense of self out of you. And when you don't have a sense of self, you don't feel like you can advocate for yourself. And when you don't have the language to advocate for yourself, you usually act it out. Either it's self-sabotage or you don't man your own station and you end up crashing. And then you hear all of the echoes from the prison itself reminding you that that's where you thrive the most in a um, controlled environment. So we, we, Tommy and I have to push through all of that and remind our participants that don't forget we were once there and maybe you haven't seen me there. Maybe we weren't on the yard together, so to speak, but what kind of questions do I need to answer to convince you that I was really there for 25 years or over a decade, like he said. And once we establish their credibility, we try to convince them that there's a system to success. And you got to buy into the system. And we use analogies that they can relate to. Most most male prisons full of testosterone and everybody understands sports analogies. And if you go to any high school or any college, there is a system that any coach tries to sell on those aspiring to join a team. And if you join a team, you have to learn the system of how they play. And when you learn the system of how they play, that's the road to success. And we try to convey to them that bucking against the system thwarts your chances of winning the championship. What's the championship? The championship is you feeling a sense of self. And just that alone is going to empower you to, to advocate for yourself and go after your success, whatever that might mean. If you take that away, I don't know what I want to do. I feel like my greatest achievement was just enduring my sentence and getting released from prison. And no, there's a whole nother mountain to climb. And I don't have the energy for it because nobody came here on the inside and got me in shape to climb another mountain. I had just enough energy to endure my sentence. And you mean to tell me there's another mountain that I could have to climb outside of prison? I'm not up for that. I'm tired. I don't have the legs for that. So I settle. And in settling, that could mean going back. So we don't wish that on anybody. We don't understand that people have their own styles of success. Sometimes some people have such great family support that that's success in their transition. Their family holds them up when they give up. They hold them all the way up when they give up. But we understand that many people don't have that. And we try to get them in shape so they can hold themselves up without any excuse. I think the sports um, model is really clarifies for people what SWIT is. Can you give us an example of like a module or something that, that so that you can give the audience an idea of, of the kind of concepts that you teach in SWIT? Yeah, um, our first one um, and our most, I think one of the most important ones is you win or you learn. No, lo no losers, win or you learn. And that particular principle is like the foundational principle of SWIT because SWIT basically is about changing mindsets and using your experiences that got you through the most traumatic time in your life. In most cases, in most of our participants, that's incarceration like us. And using those skills that you you use to get through that most traumatic time and transferring them into more marketable, more life skills out here. And so that's what that module is about, teaching people that, you know, your prison sentence it was not necessarily an L, a loss. It's more so of a, a learning situation. And once you learn your lessons from that situation, you grow from them, you bring them out here and you use them for good. Now you turn that supposedly L into a winning situation. So that learning, that win is together. 
So that's the foundational and the structure of all of what success while in transition is. That's exactly what me and Will did. We used that supposedly L that we thought we was taking in the beginning of our sentences and we learned something from it. And then we came out here and we used those same skills to win, i.e. by creating success while in transition. That's, a, that's one of the things in our lives that we can count as a win. April, you've taken some sweat classes. What did you come away from that experience with? What did you learn from sweat? Well, sweat was a program that I had heard of um, since I've been out and lived in this county, but I wasn't exactly what it was. After attending a few sweat classes, I can kind of identify with the modules. They have a 21 uh, principle module. Um, A lot of it is just common sense, but common sense often makes you think about where you are, where you need to be, and where you want to go. So um, after those modules, I think one was like um, man your station, um, for example. And man your station is pretty much, you know, you have to mind your business. You can't be all over the place. You have to tend to your needs and not really deal with anyone else's. And that's the one that probably stood out the most to me. That's interesting. Um, I've also taken some sweat classes. And for me, the thing that I really like about it is just all the back and forth. Like it's so interactive. Everybody gets a chance to talk and and provide their perspective. And um, I always learn a lot. I learn about myself from sweat. I did get that. Um, it teaches you how to how to deal with yourself. You have to man your own station. You have to deal with yourself and know yourself before you can deal with anybody else. And I do like that aspect of SWIT. It's a very good program. And I hope that it also branches out to women as well as men. Yeah, they are very interested in doing that. They will. I think they will in the future. They've got a, um, a lot of ideas and ambition in terms of what they want to do with their program. Next, we'll hear from two gentlemen who not only went through the SWIT program, but went on to become certified peer support specialists and today work with Tommy and Will. First, we'll hear from Edward Scott, who runs SWIT classes at STSG, Bessie Elmore's house in Durham. Uh, my name is Edward Scott. Live here at Straight Talk Support Group, which we call SCSG. And now I work for SCSG as the supervisor of the monitors. And I'm here doing a podcast with you. The reason we're actually speaking today is um, I want to talk to people who have been through SWIT. What would you say was the most important thing you learned from SWIT? The most important thing I think I learned from SWIT was how to navigate throughout, I say, throughout the, the, the interaction, how to navigate throughout the interaction, if I'm saying this right, um, dealing with people. Um, at first, it was so hard coming out of incarceration to actually deal with people because, you know, when you're incarcerated, you deal with so many different type of people with so many different type of ways and actions. Um, so, and everybody's not for everybody in prison. So you tend to carry that same type of attitude out here into society and it don't work. And see, SWIT helps individuals to learn how to code switch. And what I mean by code switch is most guys that's in prison, they become institutionalized, right? And they begin to think in a prison type of mentality. And they think that the same type of way they think in prison, with a, with a prison mentality, they bring that right back out here into society and it don't work. SWIT helps you learn how to deal with your boss, learn how you how to deal with relationships, um, learn how to deal with people, um, and just general. It just it just all around teaches you how to deal with life or life terms. You said that guys come out who are institutionalized. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people in the audience will not know what institutionalized means. Can you describe? What makes someone institutionalized inside? Okay, um, the best way that I can explain it that we you know most people know that we say institutionalized. It's like someone doing something repetitiously, and they're doing it. You got so so many guys that don't come out and grab hold to sweat that they come out and they do the same thing that they've been doing in the street for so long. Now they right back in prison. So when you that's a part of being institutionalized, you know nothing else. But if you come back out here. 
and go through the go through these programs, utilize these programs, and, and do what you're supposed to do. Take these programs and take them out into society and work them. You won't end back. In, it's going to be hard, but you won't end back in prison because you're utilizing the programs. So when you utilize them, more doors open up. But if you think that you could go back out here and do the same thing you've been doing, it's not going to work. That's being institutionalized because you you're doing the same thing over and over again, looking for different results. And now you're back in prison again. So that's how I look at being institutionalized. You started your transition, really, your transformation while you were inside. Yes. Um, how important do you think that has been to your success since you've been out? Um, Ms. Julia, I think that's been a great part of my success. I truly believe that every man and every woman that um, is incarcerated need to start their transition while they're in prison. Because if you think you're going to start your transition out here, now I'm not saying it's not possible, but if you think you're going to start your transition when you get out, you got a rude awakening. I say that because you got so much going on. You got to pay bills. You got to work. You know, you got to do all the things you got to do to survive out here. Inside, you got all the time in the world to read, to study, to do everything you need to do to prepare yourself for your next transition, which is freedom. So if you think you're going to just start while you just getting out and just do it, it's not going to work like that. You might have some people that can do it like that. I know I could. So my transition started 15 years ago before I even got out of prison. I began to work on myself. And when I did that, it had opened so many doors for me that I couldn't even imagine. So many people helped me with my transition because I began to work on myself. As both a teacher and as a student of SWIT, what have you observed um, from other guys who have gone through the program? Um, I have observed a lot of guys that um, that came through the class been successful, and I have observed a lot of guys that came through the class that failed. That's just life. You're going to have some people that are going to come through SWIT class that's going to be successful. You're going to have some that's not going to be successful. But the main thing that we need to do as SWIT facilitators and also SWIT students is, is to utilize, as a student, utilize what SWIT offers. As a teacher, our prayer is that we hope that we can save two or three that's coming through the class because we know you can't save everybody. We know that. I have seen so many guys that came through the SWIT class and also came through the transitional house that want everything in the world uh, to go right. They begin to be so smooth. They transition be on point. And then as soon as they get a little bit of money, um, meet a girl, get some clothes on, they forget about sweat, they forget about the rules and regulations of the house, and they become very disrespectful. That's just people, because their transition didn't start when they was in prison or when they was in any other type of institution. When we talk about transition, aren't we talking actually about a kind of transformation, a personal transformation? Yes, yes we are. Transformation is a better word than transition. But, you know, we as people of reentry, we use that a lot. Transition. But it's really a transformation. And I use me for example. You know, when I first entered the Department of Correction, I was a totally different person. I didn't, you know, I didn't think the way I think now. I didn't act the way I act now. Um, I didn't talk the way I talk now. I didn't walk the way I walk now. So throughout my conservation, I began another transformation into the person I am today. And the person I am today, I love this person. This, this is who I really, really am. So Tommy and Will want to propose that SWIT be taught in prison. Um, what do you think about that idea? I think that is a great idea. I think it gives the, it gives guys the opportunity to look at themselves while they're in prison. And it teaches them what they need to do to prepare themselves for the outside world. Because a lot of guys that's in prison don't know how to code switch. They be, take they take the same prison thinking out here and it don't work out here. The same prison thinking is not going to work when you were the boss out here. The same prison thinking is not going to work when you're in a relationship. 
the same prison thinking is not going to work when you're trying to explain to your kids about different stuff in life. It's just not going to work. I really like the interview from Mr. Scott. He has a different perspective, and everyone's perspective and experiences are all different, and our differences are what all actually blends us all together. And once you can be able to kind of um, understand where someone is coming from, it helps you keep in mind where you need to be and just keep in mind that everyone is different and we're all different and unique, but can help one another. Absolutely. Next, we'll hear from Andy McIntosh, who also was a resident of STSG in Durham when he first got out of prison. He is now the house monitor for Reentry House Plus, a reentry house in Hillsboro run by Tommy and Will. I'm Andy McIntosh, and I am the house monitor at Reentry House Plus in Hillsboro, North Carolina. How were you first introduced? to sweat. When I was released from prison in 2020, I was a resident at the Straight Talk Support Group house in Durham. And uh, I I was at a very low point in my life um, and uh, really not sure what was going to happen. Sweat gave me direction and uh, opened me up to the idea that there are possibilities and uh, positive things that can still happen even though I had been incarcerated. That's a big deal. Yes, yes, and it it helped guide me into uh, becoming a a peer support specialist and uh, set me up in a position to have the opportunity I have now. Why does SWIT work? I think SWIT works because Tommy and Will uh, have a lot of experience having been incarcerated for uh, a a large amount of time uh, themselves. So they're very relatable to somebody who is currently, uh, you know, incarcerated. And it it is in itself a form of peer support because uh, it's Tommy and Will's lived experience that really inspired them to create this course. Reentry or transition uh, from being incarcerated, it's a, it's a really difficult thing. And I myself was not incarcerated for a terribly long time. But when you have that breaking down of individuality that happens inside, it's, it's, a, it's a journey back. Uh, and then there's a lot of other obstacles that society puts in, in a person's way. And then there can even be things at like the familial level that cause uh, issues. But what Tommy and Will have done is they've created uh, a set of modules that are thought provoking and can really be very flexible to different individuals, situations and problems. And, uh, you know, the conversation that can ensue can, can be so beneficial, uh, what, you know, what I say can help another person and vice versa. So um, they, they really hit the nail on the head with uh, these, pre- these precepts. And I, I think you know, Tommy and Will have a way of inspiring the conversation because of their past uh, situations themselves. And I've also had the pleasure to meet Andy. He seemed like a wonderful guy. He, he comes from a very different place, um, unlike some of the rest. He didn't have the support that he needed initially, but he's worked through his challenges um, and is able to maintain a job as house manager. And I can see Andy moving forward um, in life and helping a lot of people that were in similar circumstances like himself. I think you're right that this job has really given Andy some purpose, Mm -hmm. really a strong sense of purpose. Yeah. I feel like he takes pride in this job. I agree. I agree. And next week, we're going to meet some people who are very special to you. 
Can you tell us about that, April? Next week, I'm going to introduce some advocates that have been um, influential uh, in my life from day one. Not just influential, just to be an advocate for me. They have loved me and taken me into their hearts and homes for before I even got out, they believed in me and believed in my case. And not only do they believe in me, they believe for those who they fight for. So I cannot wait to introduce the advocates next episode. So stay tuned to next week, the 98% Life After Prison, and hear our special episode on advocates. Advocates.